While nobody leaves humming the kick drum, big sounding drums are the key to a full energetic mix. And the way that we mic drums with close mics and overhead mics and all of that creates a lot of timing issues that turn into phase issues and that can make your drums not have as much impact as they could. So with multiple mics on the same sound source, we pay a lot of attention to our overhead mics and the way that those mics are interacting with the snare drums close mic. But in another video on phase and polarity, and you can check it out up here if you want, Aaron Zahn commented and said, rather than flipping the polarity of the overheads, why not delay the close mics to be time aligned with the overheads and come closer to having all the frequencies in phase? So that got me thinking, let's test it out. So in this video, we're gonna experiment with delaying the close mics so that they match up with the timing of that input coming into the overhead mics. Will it get punchier? Will our low frequencies ring out better? Or are we wasting our time by trying to bend the space-time continuum and other weird things are gonna happen? And then after we do all that, is it really worth doing in a live or studio context? Hey, if you're new here, my name's James and I help sound tech save the day by making great mixes and keeping you out of trouble. So if you're playing with your band on Friday and Saturday or mixing your worship team on Sunday, you found the right place. Hit that subscribe button and welcome to the club of sound ninjas. So what method are we gonna use to time align these microphones? If we just threw some random delay on the snare drum, that's not really gonna work. And the first way I thought of is to use a tape measure and measure the distance between the snare drum and the close mic and the snare drum and the distant mic or the overheads. Then we can use math to approximate the speed of sound and the distance to get for the number of milliseconds that we should delay our close mic to arrive at the distant mic or the overheads at the same time. If you're gonna get out the tape measure in the calculator, good job, here's your variables. 1130 feet per second is the average speed of sound at 70 degrees, and it goes up and down with temperature, humidity, barometric pressure, all that stuff. With the distances we're dealing with, you can approximate about 1.1 feet per millisecond, or 0.88 milliseconds per foot. And side note, this is where the metric system really trumps imperial measurements. So if you left your tape measure at home, what are some other ways that we can do this? Well, the best way in my estimation is with virtual sound check, and we'll look at that in just a minute. But if you don't have that set up, how could you do it with just the console in your ears? The real problem with that is that our brain has a hard time distinguishing delays that are under about 20 milliseconds. It's a phenomenon called temporal fusion, and you can nerd out and look it up if you want, but there's that. So now that we're back from the nerd rabbit trail, how are we actually gonna test it? Even though we can't hear the timing difference themselves and perceive it as two different signals that close together, we can hear the artifacts of what it's doing. So I thought if we're trying to get the most summation out of these two microphones and we wanna get the most low end out of it, what if we flipped the polarity on one and then delayed it until the most low end went away? So let's try that. Now, one of the things that we have to do when we're testing out things and experimenting is making sure that we're A-B testing what we're listening to and doing it back to back as close as possible. Our brains do a really good job of forgetting what something sounded like. So the closer together you can hear two examples and A-B something and have to do fewer steps in between, the better you're gonna be able to judge whether or not that made an improvement. 
Side note about this test on this console is some consoles will let you turn on and off the input delay on a channel, but the PreSonus doesn't have that exactly. So I'd have to type in zero milliseconds and 0.4 milliseconds and go back and forth trying to hear the difference. It's much easier to pay attention to differences when you're not having to do much in between. I really wish I had like an ABX switch so that I could see and really blind test whether or not this was working. But listen to this some more and you be the judge. So with virtual sound check, this gets a lot easier because we can measure timing on a screen and look at waveforms. So let's hop over to the computer and see what it looks like in Studio One, but it's going to be similar in almost any digital audio workstation that you use. So when we're going to take a look at our kick drum, we're going to zoom in right over here and we're going to try to get as close in as we can. I'm going to select these two and make them you know, big so that I can see them in the entire window. So I wanna see where this starts and this starts and measure that difference, right? So this is where it starts to go up. I'm gonna start over here and drag to the start of that one. That is about 38, 40 samples. We'll call it 38 just for good measure. I like the Voxengo sound delay plugin. Hey, clever name. And this lets me put in a delay time in samples. So I can even just type in the samples right here and I want to delay my kick in to match the timing of the kick out. So I'm going to type in 38 samples, and now it's going to pop in here on my digits. It, you can dial them in that way if you want. I like to just type it in. Now, when our kick drum is going, this is essentially delayed to be in time with that, and both these peaks are going to be more at the center in this fundamental frequency for the kick drum. So let's listen to it with and without the plugin inserted. The next thing I would want to look at is the relationship between the snare drum and the overheads. And if you're recording with virtual sound check to do this, it's helpful if you can drag your channels around to be able to put them beside one another. Again, it doesn't matter which hit we're going for, it's going to be about the same because our physics don't change. You can see that our snare drum is initially going negative pressure, so that means the top mic is not out of polarity with itself. And we're gonna take a look here from where the overheads and the snare drum meet. Now we can see here, if we take a closer look at the overhead, we can see that the overheads are not time aligned well with the snare, where the snare is different distance from the overheads themselves. So I was gonna go for my snare top to the overheads first, but I think what I'm gonna do is go from my overhead channels in between them. So if I measure there, I'd say that's about 26 samples. So on my overhead channel, which I've put over here, I have this sound delay plugin, and you can route it to be dual mono. So this is gonna allow you to delay one side differently than the other, so that we can switch back and forth and do that. 
So my right side is the one that's earlier, and I want that to be delayed a little bit to match up with this left side. I think I said 23, millise 23 samples, and maybe we'll hear a difference there, but if not, that'll be okay. Uh, life will go on if we're not perfect on this. So now I'm gonna take this between my snare top and the later overhead, and that's 119 samples. So on my snare top, I'm gonna load the same plug-in, you know, routing. I'm gonna change it to default stereo. Now there's only, you know, one side to put it on. Now we're gonna delay the snare top by this 119 samples. And now with just the snare and the overheads, let's listen to that and see what it sounds like with and without uh, both those sound delay plugins. Zoom out a little bit. So I noticed a difference, hopefully you did too. Uh, you can let me know what you think in the comments down below if it's negligible or if it's better. So I almost forgot to show you, but you can also align your kick drum to arrive at the overheads at the same time as the close mic. So we can zoom in here. Remember we're delaying this one. So we're gonna take the beginning of this one to the this one here, because again, we're delaying the left side as well, because those are not uh, perfectly the same distance from uh, both of those drums, uh, nor the overhead. We also could do the data zoom here, get a little bit finer control. We have 99 milliseconds, or excuse me, 99 samples. So on our delay from this kick drum, we can enter 99 samples. And then this one, we're gonna add 38 and 99, which is 137. So now we can test and see, is this better? Is this worse? Let's listen to just the kick drum and the overheads and see if we like it with it or without it better. I think that made a big difference. Of course, we're not using any high pass filters yet on the overheads, but before we're doing any processing, we're getting everything as fat as possible, and I think that's a win. Now that we've tested the kick and the snare, does it help with the toms too? Let's check it out. For the toms, I'm gonna make the screen as big as I can and try to do all of them, and I'll just write down what the number of samples is for the delay. I wanna make it nice and big so that I could see all of them. And this is a section where he plays all three toms, which that's fun. We're gonna zoom in here for the low tom. Uh, it's about 92 milliseconds. Write that down. For the mid tom, here we go. Zoom in. It's about 110 samples. I keep saying milliseconds are just samples. So 110 samples. Zoom out. Find the high tom. And you can see it's a little bit closer to this microphone because it's on the other side of the kit. So we're gonna measure to the closer microphone because I think that matters. So down here we're at 82 samples. So now we can punch these in on sound delay. Oh, and another thing, I forgot to mention this for the snare bottom. You wanna make sure that you just delay the snare bottom the same as the snare top because in general, you want to preserve this phase relationship between the snare top and the snare bottom. You know, this one's inverted from this one, and it's about the same distance from the drum head, at least I hope so. So that timing difference isn't going to be very significant. Uh, but for the toms here, we're going to do that. Here we go. So rack tom was 82 samples. 110 and 92. So now let's listen to just the toms and the overheads and see if that delay uh, helps or not. 
So. All right, here we go. All right, for one last listen, let's A-B all of them on and off to see if we can get them all really time aligned and if we like the difference. Now, if you really like plugins and using tools to do this job, there's one out there that's really helpful, and it's got some other things that helps you look into what the different signals are doing and how they're correlating. It's called In Phase by Waves. Let's check that one out real quick. All right, so let me load up In Phase. We're gonna choose the live mono version. So I can show you this. And here we have our alpha channel, which is our main channel that we're doing. Then we have the side chain channel. This is what we're gonna measure to compare the delay time. So the kick in is what we're gonna delay, so I've got it on that one. But on the kick out, I'm gonna take a send, and this is gonna change based on your console or whatever. And we're going to go to the side chain mono, kick in, insert one, in, five, in phase live mono. So we wanna send to that side chain. Now the signal is going from here to the side chain input over here. Now when we hit capture, it's gonna be listening for a two second window after it detects that it's playing something. Uh, and then it will show us kind of the waveform and then what we can do about it. All right, so that's all it took. Now we've got inside the plugin a way to look at the waveforms and kind of dial in what they're like. Well, we can zoom in a little bit more on the timeline and then scoot it over because we want to look at this very closely. We can change where the center of where we're zooming in is going to be so we can go even farther. And these actually don't look too bad on here. As we get a little bit closer, you can see that there's phase correlation of 0 0.03. So one means those things are identical. And negative means that it's, you know, 100% out of phase. Negative one would mean it's 100% out of polarity and identical. So we're at, we're at 0.3. Let's see if we can dial that up a little bit better by delaying the input channel a little bit closer to match the output. So we can zoom in a little bit farther here and we can see, you know, this is where the start of that one is. That's where the start of this one is. Let's take that delay and just a little bit we took it too far, I'm watching this correlation meter down here. We're getting a little bit different. Now I'm holding down control to get a little bit finer. There we go. 1.74 milliseconds gets us the best phase correlation. We don't necessarily have to use our eyes to figure out, you know, what that's going to be. So for all the frequencies, you know, we can see here at its crossing over to the zero point, that's the same right there. So the frequency is gonna be a little bit different inside and outside the kick drum, but that's what's gonna kind of show us we're at the right spot when it's coming down from that on that initial wave. We know that those are different. You can see this one is a little bit shorter. If we come over to this point, right where it starts to go down again, 
it hasn't quite gone there. So they're a little bit different frequency on the inside and the outside kick mic. But that initial rise, that initial impact that you're going to feel the most is happening right around here. And that's where we get the most correlation at 1.74 milliseconds. So now these kick drums are more in time because of the delay that we added to that one. Let's play it and then bypass this to see what it's like. Now, I think that sounded better with it in, so I'm gonna use it. Now, if you're gonna buy some Waves plugins, you can use the link down in the description below and it helps support the channel. So what's the verdict about time aligning your drum mics to arrive all at the same time? Well, to be honest, I really didn't think I would love it and I didn't think I would appreciate all the time and effort that it took to get it right. I thought there would be a lot less of a difference because of the snare drum arriving at the tom mics as well as the overheads, but it really did make a difference in the punchiness of the drums. Now, sometimes to really appreciate what's going on here, you have to not listen on a phone or even crappy earbuds and get some nice headphones or listen to it on a nice loud PA. Our ears perceive low frequencies a lot easier at higher SPLs. So if you can listen to these examples on a loud PA, you might be able to distinguish some differences that you didn't hear on your phone or on your computer that you can hear when you crank it up and it's got that big feeling. The other reason that made me skeptical and not really mind having timing differences between the different microphones is that for drums, often in a recording context, we're after sort of a texture for the drums, not necessarily an absolute impact of the drums. A lot of times in the studio, we're trying to get rid of all the transients so that we can make our mix louder. So I didn't think that that was really gonna help a lot in the studio, but things tended to ring out longer as well. So the low frequencies weren't canceling out, say for the toms and the overheads, I could see how that could make your mix feel beefier in a recording. So bottom line, am I gonna start doing this for my mixes? If I have the time, yeah, I think I will. No matter what, I'm gonna focus on getting my mic placement right, making sure that the drums sound good at the source, that the drummer feels comfortable, that everything is tuned and dampened well, and then I'm gonna go through the rest of my steps. And this is just kind of like icing on the cake. I'm still gonna be able to get great mixes without time aligning everything, and I'm not gonna nitpick and fiddle with all this stuff if the vocals don't sound good in my mix. If I'm really rushed, I'm just gonna roll up the high pass filter on my overheads and call it a day. Remember, we are after the deepest, punchiest bass that we can get, and this is one way to take it up a notch even before you start with EQ and compression. Remember, we can always high pass filter or pull down a low shelf if we've got too much low end in our microphones. But you can't boost what's getting canceled out. And if we want big drums, we're gonna have to have those low frequencies. So what do you think? Are you gonna start trying this? What problems do you see coming out of doing time alignment for your drum mics? Is Waves in phase on your wish list now? Let me know what you think down in the comments below. I love hearing the conversation between sound ninjas. If you like this video, hit thumbs up and show your support by hitting subscribe. But don't ding the little bell. You don't need more notifications in your life. Check out some more videos over here and be sure to share this with a friend. As always, remember, it's all about the low end, avoid the sound tech solo, and nobody leaves humming the kick drum. We'll see you back here next time on Attaway Audio.